I really feel the greatest hack is virtual assistants. You know, if you can build a process and a system and are, you're good with, you know, being able to communicate, you can exit a lot of businesses in a lot of time. You you really shouldn't be doing $6, $8 an hour work. If you can hire a VA to do it, you shouldn't be doing it. So that's my biggest hack is I make a list of everything I got in my plate. I pick something and hand it off to a VA. We build a process around it. It never comes back to my plate. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. Hello and welcome to episode 391. My guest today has completed over 4,000 real estate transactions, and his strategies include wholesaling, fix and flips, rentals, and property management. He also owns an 18,000 square foot warehouse stocked floor to ceiling with home building materials that he sourced up to 70% below retail. Matt Larson also runs his entire wholesaling business with virtual assistants and spends less than five hours per week on its operations. He's considered to be an industry expert and personally coach Tony Robbins on single family real estate investing. Matt, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about yourself and just how you got started investing in real estate. You know, I've been almost, it's going on close to 18 years. In November will be 18 years I've been in the business. I don't have any formal, you know, background in real estate or or didn't go to college. Actually, I went to college for one semester and at the end of the semester, they told me not to come back. So, but I, I, I'm I'm a hard worker. Like, I don't want people to think that you don't have to be sharp to be good at this this business. I've read a lot of books and hired, been in a lot of masterminds and hired a lot of really smart people over the years. Continue to, I continue to, to work on my education as well to be good at my craft. But 18 years ago, as the story goes, I was, I was living in a 300 square foot apartment. My girlfriend of four years just broke up with me. I was heartbroken. And the reason she broke up with me was because she said she wanted to date somebody with status, somebody that made money. I was just a machine shop worker at the time, didn't really understand how to make money. Saw an infomercial come come on late late one night, ordered the the books in the infomercial, and kind of the rest is history there. We Which one was that? Dean Graziosi, his books. So I, I, I and I eventually kind of a cool story. I really skyrocketed in my success. And eventually by 2009, I was featured in one of Dean's highest selling New York Times bestselling books. And then eventually by 2011 or 12, I was actually creating a lot of Dean's real estate education. I would create the course, he would pay me a royalty, and then he would sell to his his students. So we did that. I did that for eight years. I actually created all, all of Dean's real estate education for about an eight year period there. So starting with your asset class, like are are you wholesaling, fix and flipping? I mean, what what are you primarily consider yourself? So I do a little bit of everything. My strategy, a lot, a lot of times people think that wholesaling is a kind of a beginner st- strategy. And it's great for beginners because you can do no money down deals. But I still wholesale to this day. And the reason I do it is just to create the cash. It's nice to create cash flow with a wholesaling business that can generate, you know, consistent monthly deals. But I I, I like to do fix and flip and, and wholesale to generate cash so that I can do more rental properties. So the 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 whole the fix and flip and wholesale business fund the rental property business. I've owned as many as 450 rental properties at one time. Not doors, not doors and not partners, just myself, uh, different properties. Those were mostly single family homes, duplexes, fourplexes, things like that. I have done some commercial though. You know, I've done, you know, retail, larger apartment buildings and warehouses and some of that type of stuff as well. In the intro, I mentioned that you you have your wholesaling business down to five hours a week because you've hired VAs to do most of the work. Talk about that. How did you set up those systems? To, to bring the VAs in? I say five hours, but it's really not that. It's for probably less than two. And here's how, here's how I spend my time. I do two meetings a week with my wholesaling team. 
one on Monday and one on Thursday. And the meetings are scheduled for 30 minutes. And I typically finish them in about 20 minutes. Other than that, the magic behind not doing the the day-to-day business is I have a VA. So here's kind of how my layout of my wholesaling business works and why I don't have to spend much time. Number one is I have a, a rock solid lead manager that manages the whole operation. But we have cold callers and marketing VAs to do direct mail, cold calling, and text message marketing. Those VAs generate leads. Those leads come to the lead manager. The lead manager determines if it's a good lead or a bad lead. Bad leads are just leads with maybe no equity or don't fit our buy box, whatever. Then from there, they hand that lead off to a virtual acquisition salesperson on our team. And they are, they, they do, we do a two call system. The first call, they just build rapport with the seller, learn all about the property, find out what the seller's asking and all that stuff. And then they turn that information back to lead manager. Lead manager crunches numbers, determines what the max offer price is, hands that lead back to the acquisitions person. We make the offer. Once we get it accepted, it just goes over to Dispo and the whole circuit is complete. So in that process, I'm not needed, okay? But you have to have leadership in any business. So my job in those two meetings is to look at KPIs. I look at KPIs every day. So that's another thing I spend maybe a few minutes on a day. So I'm always looking at KPIs. I'm involved in the team meetings and I'm reviewing things. But when it comes to Matt, should we buy this house? Or Matt, what do I have to sell this house for? Or what do you think we should do here? I'm not needed in those day-to-day conversations because we've built processes and systems to help each individual team member answer those questions. How long did it take you to put that together and and train the people that are, are working with you? And how did you do that? I've been running that style of operation now for over five years. So this isn't something new, but It probably took, because I didn't really know anybody doing it that way. So it probably took us a few years in trial and error to really dial everything in. But really the magic behind it was building, you know, documented video and text processes for every single thing. So first thing we did was lay out what we call a flow chart. Here's where we, here's where we're at. Here's what happens next lead comes in, you know, what do we do here? And you build a flow chart of your whole business. That's really important. And then from the flow chart, each individual bubble on a flow chart is its own series of processes written in written in video processes. And once we figured that out, then if a team member comes or goes, you just plug them back into the new or the system that you've already got that's that's created and and works. Is there training that you've recorded or that you can give them that just helps them plug right in? Yep. Everything, all of it's training. So the processes are recorded, but also the training. We have complete libraries that only we use in the inter- internal business of how to do every piece. I mean, we're talking hundreds, literally hundreds of videos that we've created over the years so that when we don't have to repeat ourselves. If somebody has a question, hey, here's how that's answered just watch this video. And we typically like to keep those training videos and all the videos on processes to three to five minutes. So you're not stuck watching a two hour long thing. You can go right to the title. Okay. I need to know how to do this. Okay. That's that title here. Let's go watch that video. Anytime we have these, these systems and processes conversation, I always find it very fascinating. So I want to dig in a little deeper. Where are those videos? Do you keep, do you have a YouTube page? Do you have like an internal page? Very good question. We started out using a, a website called sweetprocess.com. And then our, we, we, we kind of just grew so big, we now use Kajabi. Could, so if for your listeners out there, sweetprocess.com is like 100 bucks a month or less. And it's, it's really all you really need until you get really, really big and sophisticated. And Kajabi is like 400 bucks a month. But it's, it's great for what we're doing because we have so many different divisions in the business and, and stuff. So we use Kajabi. That, that's where the library is stored now. And what else does Kajabi allow you to do? Are you, are you using it for internal communications or are you using something else like Slack or Asana? No, we communicate through our CRM. We actually we built our own. I, I had a Podio programmer from California on retainer for two years. I mean, I put a couple hundred grand in my Podio system that we built, but we communicate through Podio and you just, it's super simple. You just tag somebody a question and wherever they're at in that deal, you know, all the details of, of the deal itself. So we we're pretty efficient that way. 
What about AI? AI really like it's come out of nowhere all of a sudden. And the experts I hear on this are saying it's going to just it's going to change everything overnight. Have you started integrating that at all into your systems? It's kind of a flashy gimmick right now, but it's going to be enormous. It's going to be crazy. We do mess with AI and we use it. I've taught every team member a little bit about it. We do use it, but it's not it's not quite good enough yet. It is. T- there's a lot of time saver right now with AI. You have time savers, right? But you don't have the brain power orchestrated well enough. We're just in the we're in the frontier of this thing. We're in the the, the infancy of what of what you can imagine it can do. But there's still a lot of programming pieces that are needed to really go to the next level. So we do use it. It's great for a lot of different things, but it's still like a question mark for a lot of people. Like we, everybody that's using it knows how powerful it's going to be, but they don't know how to connect all the dots quite yet. But it, it's pretty neat. So for example, one thing we used, we can type up a script on how to do a process. And we used to have to film that script, right? You'd turn the camera on, you'd film it, you hope you get it right. Now we don't have to do that. We can just type out the script feed it into an AI video program and the, the, the person comes on and reads it perfectly, never messes up. So an AI person, like a, an animated person or a more realistic person? It, it looks realistic. You can't hardly tell that it's not a real human. The other thing that it can do is it can capture my voice. So you can create videos with my voice. If you feed it enough of the videos that I've created, it can re-mimic my voice. And it's not perfect yet. It's still a little bit robotic, but it's it's pretty wild. So we're using it for things like that. We can use it to build framework around different copywriting stuff that we want, that we need, and then just tweak from there. But it's it is a shortcut. There are some shortcuts. Again, you know, I'm big on virtual assistants, and I've tasked my own virtual assistants to, hey, go out and study this and find out if it can do your job for you. Don't worry. We're not going to fire you. We'll move you into something different. But we are like, that's kind of my hope is I'm hoping that AI, and I know it will happen. It's just a matter of when, but we'll be able to replace people with the AI eventually. What is the program or app you're using to feed your script into and and have a person actually so I wish I knew exactly which that what that was. My team, again, I just taxed my team to find it. They found it. I, I don't know the, the name of it off the top of my off the top of my head. I love that you're a systems guy and you put people in place to you to figure all this stuff out for you. How have you put the systems together for your fix and flip business? The fix and flip business has a lot more moving parts than say a wholesaling business. We like the fix and flip business, though, because typically the margins are higher. It just takes a little longer to get paid because you actually take it down. But we built out what we did was we built a whole project management component to my Podio system that allows us to get, you know, gather, you know, when we close on the deal, you can manage all the utility turn ons, you can manage the blueprinting through it, you can manage all the contractor bids. You can communicate with the project management team back and forth. You can take pictures and upload those of progress. So we've just tried to automate all that with our with our Podio system. And it, it's working. I mean, it works really well. And I've got my my 18,000 square foot kind of like I call it my mini lows, where we where we're able to go out to vendors, bid out our entire year's worth of of usage and get like a EAU, an estimated annual usage price. So we don't have to take the whole year right now, but we take a certain portion, we put it on our shelves, we built a barcode in an online store, and then we can pull down that product when we need it and track it through our website. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about green property management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then green property management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property manager interested in applying green property management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. 
If you are thinking of leaving your W-2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is health care for you and your family. When I made this transition myself, I found the whole health care insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB and Associates. Chad is a professional health insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best health care options. And best of all, his services are covered by the insurance company and won't cost you a dime. If you live in Michigan and are expecting a change in your health care insurance coverage for any reason or losing employer coverage or transitioning into Medicare, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at rcbassociatesllc.com. I wanted to get more detail on that. You have an 18,000 square foot warehouse. You're acquiring product and materials at up to 70% discount. Talk about that. Obviously, you must be doing enough volume of fix and flips to, to warrant that. But take us through that thought process. How is that saving you money and time? Here's the thing is you have to be doing a certain num- a certain amount of volume to make it worth it. Otherwise, don't do it. And what I, I would say, if you're not doing at least, you know, 50-ish plus deals a year, it probably doesn't make sense. At my highest volume ever, we were doing about 40 flip, 40 fix and flips per month. That was leading up to the to the peak there. And then I started selling that stuff off as the peak as it peaked out. Are you talking in 2008 or more recent peak? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. I, I bought I was buying hundreds per year back in 08, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. But we started, I, I predicted, and I was off by a little bit, but I predicted the peak to be in the 2018, 17 range. So we sold a bunch going through that. 2019, we sold a bunch. And then at, during 2020, when COVID hit, I went and bought a boatload of houses after it hit and the market shrunk. Remember when COVID hit, the market shrunk real quick and then ballooned up. I bought about 80 homes in, in about a 60 day period there, held on to them. And then when the market rebounded, we sold a bunch through there too. But you know, it's last the last year or so, the fix and flip market's been a little bit tricky. So we slowed down a little bit. But to answer your question, you know, we've done a lot of volume to make it worth it. If you know, and what we do, it's really simple. The concept's not that difficult. But really what we do is we we take our our stack of SKUs, our just our our SKUs for all the different products we use, and we send them out to all the different vendors. And we have them bid the, you know, hey, if we buy 20,000 of these pieces a year, can you give me a price on 20,000? We don't have to take the 20,000. We can take, you know, 1,500 a month or whatever it is. So we get we get that annual price, and then we agree to put some on our shelves, and then that's how we save all the money. So we might be buying from, you know, HD Supply or Home Depot or Menards or Wilmar or Amazon Business. We got all these different vendors that we're buying from, and they're competing against each other to get the best price. The, the amazing piece is where the where the real savings is is paint. There's more mar- there's more margin in paint than people realize. What maybe some people pay like forty or fifty dollars a gallon for the high end high quality paint, we're getting for ten bucks. So we're able to buy a lot of that stuff really cheap. In fact, just the paint paid for my my 18,000 square foot warehouse per year, the savings we got on paint, one product. If your listeners out there, if you're ever gonna try this and you're not doing as much volume, go out and start with paint because you'll probably save your money on that side of things easiest. Do you have a system where basically you're using the same color, the same paint, the same finishings and, and fixtures throughout all your properties? And that's why you're able to just buy the same thing in bulk. Is that the concept there? Exactly. We stick with the price range of home that, you know, that hundred and fiftieth thousand dollar house, we stick with that level of house. It's basically kind of like the starter home or maybe a step up home. You don't have to have unique fancy finishes like you would on a four or $500,000 house. So we just keep it basic and we do kind of the McDonald's of the re the rehab business. It's the same repeatable system over and over and over again. And, and that allows us to just use the same products and that's where you save your money. What are some of those products? If you don't mind just saying, okay, for this 
type of house, which is a hundred to hundred and fifty thousand dollar house. Like what is what are the typical vendors or finishes that you're going to use? I mean, it's just we we use like the LVT flooring. We're we're big on using that. We use the same Delta faucets, the same. You know, I think it's the A.O. Smith water heaters. We have the same cabinets. We order from a cabinet company, same countertops. I mean, they're like a Formica, a nice, you know, very good looking Formica countertop. We go with granite every once in a while for, for the most part. We go with Formica, but the same light fixtures, basic light fixtures and doorknobs and doors and trim and all that stuff. It's just a good looking version, just not on the highest end. But I, I will say, that we can buy pretty high end stuff for a lot less money because of the volume and the pricing we get. So we're getting a very good we don't do things like what's that brand that Home Depot sells like the the real cheap brand that every every big box store sells. We don't we don't use that stuff at all. It's junk. It's just not good. We don't use like the you know what's the toilets the I don't know. The 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 100 dollar toilets. We don't use those. We buy the you know, the expensive three or $400 toilet, but the difference is we get it for 150 bucks. So the Delta faucets that might cost somebody two, 300 bucks, we're getting for, you know, 80, $90. How did that help you during, during the past couple of years when the supply chain was in such disarray and, and people were having a real hard time getting supply? It was great for us. We never got, we never got tripped up. So we had material, we had stock, and we had a lot of people calling us because there's a lot of local guys that know I have a lot of inventory. We don't sell to other people, but I got a lot of calls. Hey, do you think, could you sell me this or sell me that? And we're like, no, we need it for ourselves. And we don't really have, we're not set up to sell to other people. So, but yeah, that was great. That helped us. And it also helped during the, you know, just the inflationary deal. Because, you know, when inflation's coming, you can see that and you can go buy a whole bunch of stuff and you have the room to 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 store it so you can kind of protect and hedge against the higher pricing. So the inventory that you have now in your warehouse, when was that per, was that purchased in the last year, the last couple of years so that you did some good pricing? Yeah, no, we we turn it quicker. We hold maybe 2 months of inventory on our shelves at any time. We turn the inventory every 30 to 60 days unless we know something's happening and we have to go buy a whole bunch, you know, so so we kind of try to, we tr- we don't like sitting on a ton of inventory. I mean, there's probably some things that have been around for six months that, you know, you could buy, for example, you could buy 50 of them and it's, you know, I'll use easy math. You got to buy 50 of these and it's a hundred bucks, or you can buy, you know, 300 of them for 50 bucks. Let's just buy the 300 and, you know, it's the same price. We'll just maybe keep them on the shelf a little longer until we use them all. Do you ever go direct to the manufacturer to get like maybe on the water heaters or, or whatnot? Yeah, we buy directly. We're, we we buy some things direct from like train for furnaces and central air units and some of that type of stuff. And there's probably some other w- unique websites that we use that go directly to the manufacturer. But for the most part, it's still through distribution chains. And the, it's just through the bigger distribution chains that a lot of people probably don't think about. Everybody just thinks big box store, and that's that's perfect for the average guy doing three, four, five, ten deals a year. You know, what really sparked it for me? What January of 2017, I made my annual trip to to Lowe's to the main Lowe's store. We bought most of our product from. I always met with the the store, the general manager of the store, because we were buying millions of dollars a year from that store. And one January, he said, Matt, you had a real good year last year in 2016. You bought $2.2 million worth of a product. It was like 2.2 or 2.4, something in that range. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty good. He goes, yeah, it's 10% of our sales at this store. And I was like, that caught me off guard. I didn't realize I was that big of a customer. And I immediately said, just off the top, I said, like, man, you got to give me a better price. I'm basically paying what everybody else is paying, doing two or three deals a year. And he's like, no, Matt, we we give a, we give you the everyday greatest lowest price. And I was just like, okay. I went back to my team and I'm like, we gotta we gotta figure this out. We gotta start saving some money. And that's kind of how that idea was born. Tell us about your relationship with Tony Robbins and just how you came to be sort of his single family concierge or what consigliere or whatever you call it. So in 2000, this is a few years ago. This is nine years ago now. 
Tony Robbins was getting a lot of flack from his critics because he was like, you know, the critics were like, man, Tony, you're bringing 5, 10, 15,000 plus people to an event. You're getting them all pumped up and they, you know, they, they leave, they're excited and then they don't have a business to plug into. So it's kind of like they were just giving them a hard time. Like man, they leave and they're the same person they were in two weeks after they leave. So Tony looked around and he wanted to figure out what business would be a good business for his students. And he looked at a lot of different things, stocks and different things. And he finally chose real estate, but he wanted to go single family real estate because anybody can learn how to do that. It's the barrier to entry is not difficult. So he, he, the problem was he'd never done single family home real estate. So he started asking around. One person led to another, to another, to another. You got to talk to this guy. You got to talk to this guy. No, this guy's really good. And finally, it went to Dean Graziosi. And Dean wasn't doing tons of his own deals. He was buying a lot of real estate, but he wasn't involved in the purchasing and the wholesale and all that. I was doing that. So Dean's like, Matt, you got to teach Tony. So so I flew to Las Vegas, met with Tony for three days in a, in a big, enormous private hotel room at the Wynn Casino. And I taught Tony Robbins. He was my student for three days while I taught on a whiteboard and he sat in a chair in front of me and took notes and asked questions. And he's a very, very smart guy. Very, very, he never, he never checked his phone or took a phone call on a business call at all in three days. Total immersion. Was that intense? Were you nervous to, to be in a room with him for three days? Because I went to introduce myself and I couldn't speak. I mean, I was, I was overwhelmed, but I, I, I shook off the nerves and did what I do. And it, it turned out great. Tony put me, he's like, man, in return, pick any event you want to come to of mine. I'll put you in the front row. So six months later, I went to one of his events and he put me right in front. I had celebrities sitting behind me. You know, it was pretty neat to people were probably like, who's this guy? But it was pretty wild. He's a, he's a great guy. He's, he's, he's what you would expect behind the camera. You've listed so many great apps and, and systems, but are there any other of your favorite hacks or apps that you would like to share with our audience? There's so many things that we do. I really feel the greatest hack is virtual assistants. You know, if you can build a process and a system and you're good with, you know, being able to communicate, you can exit a lot of businesses in a lot of time. You you really shouldn't be doing $6, $8 an hour work. If you can hire a VA to do it, you shouldn't be doing it. So that's my biggest hack is I make a list of everything I got in my plate. I pick something and hand it off to a VA. We build a process around it. It never comes back to my plate. And Matt, how would people find out more about you and or get a hold of you? Well, I'm most active on Facebook. I have a Instagram account too. People can find Real Matt Larson is that account. I had a really big Instagram account. It got hacked and I lost it two years ago, which was a bummer because I had a lot of followers. So I haven't been as active there, but I still check it every once a day and get messages. But Facebook, if you just do a search for my name, you'll see my Facebook come up and I, I communicate a lot there. I'm on there every day. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And I really enjoyed hearing about how you've systematized your fix and flip and your wholesaling with virtual assistants and the specialized Podio software that you put together. Really interesting stuff. And I especially loved hearing about your warehouse and how you're acquiring your supplies in bulk and saving up to 70%. And then thanks, of course, for sharing the story about Tony Robbins. It's been a real pleasure talking with you today. I've had fun. I, I enjoy telling the story and sharing. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. And you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com. 